Good evening, everyone. Good evening, we're about to get started now. I'd like to welcome you all to HP. My name is Fran Ayala Samayajala. I'm the head of population health worldwide, and it's a pleasure to have you here for what is a, a, well, a topic that's near and dear to my heart and undoubtedly to many of yours as we all stay committed to these efforts, which are some of the most persistent challenges in the industry. I always like to start off these programs by ask, answering the question that some of you might have in the back of your minds, which is, what is HP doing in healthcare? The reality is, HP has over 50 years in healthcare. If you think back to the cardiac ultrasound, HP was very much involved in those technologies. And even though we have morphed over time, changed, even most recently have split our company into two, Hewlett Packard Enterprise on the other side of the parking lot, and uh, the true blue HP, which we are, um, we continue to invest within the healthcare industry in many ways. I need a little, where's my little, I know I have, my hand was empty. Can I get a, yes. thank you. And, and so one way in which we're doing this is uh, with Intelli is really um, in the form of interconnected uh, technologies. So think about the internet of things and being able to leverage that. And looking across the spectrum to things like, I love this concept of the um, non-worried sick, um, along with um, Dr. Setivora, the tribal communities of Connecticut, we began to talk about the non-worried sick. That is individuals like diabetes, who may, who ha may have diabetes who are not exhibiting symptoms, um, but in fact are uh, even at greater risk or the fact that there are challenges within rural communities and be able to engage, engage with the veterans affairs as they are focused on extending telehealth and investing in, in communities or working a, right alongside with telco companies like Verizon and T-Mobile who are making, in fact just week, made announcements that they're going to be providing zero uh, cost for access to hel telehealth sessions. These are the kinds of things that we are involved in because at the end point, the devices that you are leveraging for the kinds of solutions that you're putting to market really need to be, if we'll turn the slide for me please, advance that, really need to be focused on patient-friendly devices. And that's what makes a difference. Form factors make a difference. Older adults love technology. And when we talk with them, we find that while cell phones are great because their daughter or their son have introduced it to them, their preference is actually a 12-inch tablet. Their preference is actually an all-in-one device. And in fact, we see in many markets around the world where those are, the lead, are some of the leading technologies amongst those who are 75 years of age and older. I personally spend a lot of time with older adults teaching them yoga in an online environment using these types of technologies. We also recognize that there are struggles in the implementation. How do we go about deployment at scale and be able to introduce technologies in ways that allow for people to embrace them through increasing their education? So these are some of the themes that HP is very much committed to and it gets translated into all kinds of stuff like 3D printing and virtual reality. I'm going a little longer tonight because it's the end of the, of the year and it's always so fun at holiday time to come together. And I just wanted to give you an opportunity to, to pause and think about the ways in which you may be able to work with HP as we are inventing in the space and are investing in the space. And we welcome the opportunity to, think, uh, to talk with you. I'd like to thank you for your time. Again, thank you for being here. And I'm going to pass it over to my esteemed colleague, Archana, Dr. Archana Dubey. Hi, welcome. Um, I am a practicing physician and global medical director at HP. Um, I wanted to end the year, with, along with my wonderful co-host, we decided to end the year uh, with the topic of vitality. And it's important because we started with the first session was uh, future of clinics, then we went to mental and behavioral health, then we went to precision health, and all of those were looking at certain clinical endpoint for all of the patients. How is your hemoglobin A1C is doing? How is your blood pressure? But nobody really asked the patient why are you here? What's your endpoint you're looking for? And majority of the time, for most of my patients, they want to see the best version of themselves. They don't want to care about the hemoglobin A1C where it is. They want to feel energetic. They don't want to worry about the sleep apnea they're dealing with. 
they want to feel well rested in the morning. So I just wanted to uh, start the day or start the evening with th that thought in mind and have a great couple of panels here and a couple of really good innovations that we'll talk about. But before we launch into this, I want to invite the first story of the night, Rina. She's going to share a story today with us. Thank you so much, Archana. Thank you, Bambi and Fran, for giving me this opportunity today. So I'm Rina Jadav, a little bit about myself. February 12th, 2016, I found myself at 3 a.m. on the bathroom floor. I couldn't breathe. I was clutching the doorknob, and I couldn't breathe because I had looked in the mirror, and I knew I was going to die. So it had been a really tough day. Actually, it had been a really tough four months or so. I had started four months ago in September of 2015 with a couple of crazy symptoms, hives, rashes, and very quickly it became 28 symptoms. But the worst symptom that was that I was losing a pound a week for no cause. I was down to 90 pounds. Um, I had a whole bunch of other symptoms. You know, I couldn't feel my fingers. I'd wake up in the middle of the night with bloodshot eyes that were completely swollen shut. All kinds of crazy symptoms. So I was living at the hospital basically being tested for everything. Now I had had colon cancer at 35, so there was a belief that there might be cancer lurking. Anyway, so this morning, I had had a meeting with my very brilliant, very young Stanford-trained MD, who sat me down and said, Rena, your 14 specialists and I have spoken, and you are the healthiest sick person we know. There was nothing wrong with you. So, I think you're depressed. I think you're anorexic. I'm going to prescribe some antidepressants for you. I recommend you go see a therapist. And yes, you do have symptoms, so we're gonna give you prednisone. It's a steroid. Somebody knows what prednisone is. I was speechless. And then I got fucking mad. This fill-in-the-blank doctor was telling me that me, a Harvard MBA, Wharton undergrad, three startup founder, had nothing better to do with my life than to hang out at the hospital and get tested because I was depressed. I was so angry, I thought I was going to hurt somebody. Now, you don't understand that kind of rage. Um, that was one of my symptoms. Insane <laughs> rage where I wanted to hurt people. I somehow made it home. I somehow went to bed. I woke up at 3 a.m., again, full of rashes and hives, and I looked in the mirror, and I knew I was going to die if I didn't do something. So I had two decisions. Um, one was that I could take the antidepressants, and I could go to see a therapist, and basically believe what they were telling me, which is, Rena, you're getting old, deal with it. You know, you're 44 years old, like this is how your body's aging, deal with it. Or I could figure out how I was gonna take charge of my life. And now I had dealt with crisis before, I'm a startup queen. I dealt with startup crisis before and I looked in the mirror and said, Rena, you can do this. You've, you've had crisis before. So two things were bothering me. One, I knew I was not depressed. I was being told I was depressed. I was not clinically depressed. I knew that for a fact. I was sad, I was unhappy, I was not depressed, I was not going to take antidepressants. I knew I was not anorexic. I was taking almost two and a half thousand calories a day. I was inhaling coconut oil and ghee. I was not anorexic. So I thought maybe he's wrong about the steroid. Maybe I shouldn't take that either. So I decided that I was gonna fight for my health and see where it went. I decided to apply the six startup principles that I knew had worked for me in the past. Number one, make no assumptions. Clearly, I didn't know what created health, and neither did my doctors. So I was going to start from scratch and teach myself what the hell is health anyway. Number two, I was going to find patients that were sick and had gotten better with my symptoms. Because, hey, other founders in here, you know how that works, right? As a startup, you find someone who's had a successful model and you copy it. So I was going to do that. Number three, I was going to find doctors that knew what they were doing. Because my doctors didn't. But there had to be doctors out there and guess what, I found them. So top doctors in Ayurveda, acupuncture, traditional Chinese medicine, functional medicine, integrative medicine, these were amazing doctors. And as I listened to them, I thought, oh my God, everybody needs to listen to them. So I created the Healthier Podcast. You can check it out, top 50 doctors are on it. Um, Mark Hyman, Dean Ornish, etc. Next, 
as I was listening to them, they were saying all kinds of great stuff like, go do hyperbaric chamber, go check out the cryotherapy, take glutathione pots, shots in your butt, and I did it all. Um, and that became my blog experience. So you can check out health boot camps, and I started sharing my journey of all these crazy things I was doing to myself. As I listened, I realized I had to start tracking stuff. So I created the health journal, and again, if anybody wants a copy, a free copy of the health journal, just ping me. Um, and I can send that to you, but I started tracking everything. I started tracking moods, meds, foods, everything. And a pattern emerged. And the pattern was that I had to change everything that I was doing. And I did. I eliminated gluten, corn, soy, caffeine, yep, even green tea, alcohol, ouch, that hurt. Sugar, that was the most brutal. I took it all out. I cooked three times a day, local organic seasonal food. My family thought I was nuts. Um, 16 months later, I had reversed every symptom. And I was back. I was healthy again. And the journey from 3 a.m. in the bathroom till today has been magical. I have um, felt music, not heard, but felt music in meditation. I've seen a mystic six feet away from me. I've seen his face disappear and reappear as pixels. Um, but I've also faced the I've also faced the existential crisis that we have in America today. 116 million Americans have chronic illness. In fact, most of us in this room, I'm going to say it again, most of us in this room are going to die of a lifestyle disease that is totally preventable. And 50% of our grandkids are going to have autism. But I have good news. We are all going to have Alzheimer's, so we're not going to know. <laughs> we're going to be fine. I don't know if you're OK with this future. I'm not. So I'm doing something about it. I've created a foundation. It's a 501c3, health boot camps, and everything I do, all the great information we create is as a nonprofit. It's all available to you for free. Um, there's some amazing people here, like Esther Dyson, who are doing Velville. I'm not the only person on this path. But what I urge everyone in this room today is to think as you're creating the future, let's create a company that reverses chronic illness. We can do that. We can rethink of what a unicorn is as a company that heals a million people or more. I hope you'll join me. May the force be with us. Thank you. Well, that's okay. Thank you, Rena. Um, we wanted Rena to share this story because it really what it shows is the problem, and no offense to the medical industry, but some of the problems with the way um, we administer care and treatment, which is, Rena, you're depressed, take these antidepressants. Or Rena, you have these symptoms, take this steroid. And we're not digging deep enough into the root cause of the problem and she had to do that and she had to take that journey herself and I think that's what we're trying to do here is try to understand is there data um, new technology out there that can help us get to the root cause of our problem so we could change our behavior not just take medications and not um, take the typical treatments. Arshana is a physician and so she's looking for those new services and products and new data uh, to help her do her job better. So um, really quickly, we are all in a circle here, somewhat of a circle here, uh, and so it's designed for everybody to share information. So this is really interactive. We say that every single time, but now we hope it's really interactive because you're staring at one another. So we really want everyone to share something, uh, ask a question, feel free to do that. You don't need a mic. Uh, there was supposed to be a mic there, but even if you don't have a mic, just feel free. Raise your hand, and we will, and we will have you share. So, with that, I want to have the panelists come up. We're going to start with our venture panel and talk to investors who are looking into great new technologies that are changing our behavior, so we could sleep better, uh, you know, eat. Um, better and be more mindful and what's the other one the four pillars of health the four pillars of health the most important Eat. one the sleep the sleep yes. okay believe it or not it's the sleep right and the second one is eat well 
eat better. So we have a couple of lifestyle folks who will be talking today. So make sure you eat all the cheese and yes, sugary please. stuff and drink more wine. Please. Yes. Sugar sodas, that's what we have Sugar here. Sodas. We have tea too. Yes. Um, okay. And then yep. the third one is move. Oh, exercise. Exercise. Yeah. Or move. And the fourth one is, I don't like calling stress management. Just be mindful of where you are and who you're hanging out with. So, thank you. Okay, so we have, I believe we have one person, Josh, who is unfortunately on a tarmac or something, but hopefully yes. he will be here soon. So now we have our three venture capitalists. They have all invested in startups in this area. So I'm going to have them introduce themselves and also talk a little bit, as you introduce yourself, talk a little bit about why this area interests you. All right, I'll go first. Uh, my name is Will Quist, I'm managing partner at Slow Ventures. We are, for now, a seed stage fund, um, kind of evolved organically from some work my friends did as they were colleagues at Facebook and it built it into a bit of a leading seed stage firm where we're writing million, million and a half dollar checks. Um, we're a generalist. I think we kind of float around a bunch of sectors. Um, I think our line is that Founders are the authors of the future, we're just an editor. So we kind of have to go to where they are writing. Um, that said, I, we've done a few things opportunistically in health, um, and my partner Dave Morin has gotten very, very passionate about the what, what he calls the brain health space, because he says, what is mental anyway? Um, so I flip flop, I try to stay consistent on brain health, though, though he is really, staked himself with a life goal of curing depression and I think has brought us all along with him on that journey. And what's been interesting for us is the more you uncover that, you unpack everything goes into that. It, 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 it's become fashionable to say that we're involved and interested in invent, investing in mental health and brain health. And the reality is, is that's the central organ. <laughs> so all of your other health needs tie up to that. Um, I think the other interesting lens I bring is my wife's actually a practicing physician. She's been a hospitalist at the VA for the last seven years and has just made a transition to concierge medicine this week, um, which has been an interesting contrast that I could share some of the personal perspective on the practice of medicine, the differences between bureaucracies trying to serve at scale, where you have well-intentioned physicians all across the board, bureaucracies trying to serve at scale versus people with a lot of means and resources on the concierge medicine side that are pushing the envelope in terms of what tech does, how do you adopt things, and it's been really interesting to watch her perspective change, even in the past, she's been, three, this transition is three months coming, it's been interesting to see her receptiveness to new data, new technologies, new approaches, and how that compares and contrasts around the VA. Was I supposed to say the things we've invested in, or? Uh, we can save that. Okay, so that's me. Yeah, my name is Jake Chapman. I'm a managing partner at Alpha Bridge Ventures. We are, uh, we say a post-seed stage fund, but pre-series A, so we focus on uh, pejoratively bridge rounds. Um, we are also sector small agnostic. A. Small A, I like small A better, or A classic, if you will. Uh, a vintage, A, a. a traditional. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's an interesting one, for sure. Um, yeah, so we're, we're sector agnostic, um, but the whole thesis behind our fund is that healthy founders will generate healthy returns. And so um, we are interested in the health space, less as an investor and more as a consumer. And um, our third partner is a clinical psychologist, Dr. Carrie Sullins, uh, and who has put together a program for us that we put all of our founders through. It starts with a, a detailed assessment of their strengths and weaknesses and what they want to work on in their lives. And then the firm, we pay for it, we then get them uh, what we call a life board of directors, and that is uh, an executive coach usually is one member of that life board, but every other member is very customized. So it could be a nutritionist or a sleep therapist or a standard therapist or a mindfulness coach, um, and those life boards are usually four or five people. Uh, we believe in an integrated health approach um, with our founders, and we just think that at the end of the day, our companies will be more successful because our founders will be more resilient and able to handle the challenges that they face. Um, so yeah, so that's a little bit about us. Okay, does this work? Yeah, thank you. I'm uh, Ariel Poehler. I'm actually an angel investor, so I um, just invest uh, personally. 
and uh, super angel, super angel, uh, which I've been doing for over 20 years. Up until a few years back, I was uh, a sector agnostic, if you will. So did lots of different things across the board, always in technology. Um, my first uh, involvement that started to get close to the space was Strava, where I've been involved from day one, which is about athletes and wellness and so on. And uh, a few years back, maybe because I'm a big science fiction fan, I started thinking about human augmentation and is there, are there opportunities there for augmenting humanity? And one thing I realized early in the process was there was a big overlap between the technologies that we can use to take a healthy individual and make them, uh, augmenting them, and, that, and those same technologies can be used to cure a lot of conditions. Uh, and, and vice versa, you could have technologies that were initially developed to treat a condition, but guess what, a healthy person um, can benefit from that. So that's been the specific focus that I've, that I've been working on for the past few years. And uh, it's arbitrary, I mean, some of this, it's arbitrary how you define it, you know, is this augmentation, is that augmentation, so. Uh, it's a little arbitrary, but um, again, technologies that at the very least can augment us and in most cases also help healthy people. So some examples um, on the board of Neosensory, um, David Eagleman's project where it's uh, haptics to convey additional information. So our first product is gonna help people that are either deaf or have a hearing disability to uh, perceive sound through their skin. It's fascinating, the brain is so plastic, it picks it up. But on the other hand, we've done research where you take a healthy person, say a drone pilot or an Air Force pilot, and you give them information through the same device and that helps them uh, do a better job. Uh, exoskeletons, I've been involved with a couple of companies, uh, Rom Robotics, which uh, first product is for skiers, help you ski better, but obviously that same can be used for someone that has a mobility limitation. Um, company that recently changed its name, BiosHealth, used to be called Cambridge Biogmentation. It's about interfacing between artificial prosthetics and other uh, digital information, that digital devices that need to uh, interface with the body. So I'm, I'm involved with that. Um, and I'm sure I'm forgetting a few, but those are the kind of projects uh, that, I'm, that I'm into. So I have a, I have a question for uh, for Jake about how you're approaching vitality, because we are on the topic of vitality. And it's such an interesting approach of your uh, venture fund to look at the health of the founders, because it's almost like if you don't have somebody who's starting a new innovation, that they would not have a good outcome. So you are definitely having focus not just what you're investing in, but who you're investing in with with that core focus. How did you get to that? What, was, what were the driving features that kind of made that decision in your company? Sure, it's a great question. Um, so Alpha Bridge Ventures is my second fund. My first one was called Gelt Venture Capital. And I realized a couple years into that fund that the biggest problems my founders were facing or the problems that they were least individually well equipped to deal with were all around like mental health and wellness and leadership development. They were very human problems and not product market or technology problems. And that doesn't mean that the companies didn't have those kinds of problems, but the founders were actually the most well equipped to fix those problems themselves. They just needed help in every other aspect of their life, right? Because founders give everything to their companies and so everything else tends to fall to the wayside. So you end up with you know, the freshman 15, everyone knows the freshman 15, but the founder 15 is a very real thing as well. Um, you know, and with that comes, you know, less clarity of thought, I think, and poor nutrition certainly impacts a person's ability to lead a company and be at their best, right? So the idea that if we can come in and invest our resources in helping founders with all the other aspects of their life, make sure they're getting enough sleep, make sure that Whatever, even if it's only 20 minutes a day, they can get some physical activity into their, their lives and help them be a happier, more well-rounded person that they'll show up for work and like be their best every day. And if, that we, do, if we do that and they live a vital life, then uh, they'll just be more successful. They'll overcome the business challenges. I, I think you know, what's great that how Jake has set up basically his own due diligence process because he is essentially bringing in all of these new technologies 
and and then seeing how the founders interact with it and then potentially maybe those are companies that you would invest in as well. So um, it probably is helping, right, for you to actually look at new technologies that you want to invest in. It is, well, so I would say that our focus definitely helps in due diligence. So our mm -hmm. third partner um, who runs the program, she's involved in all of our diligence meetings with, with founders. And so she brings a very different perspective um, and asks a lot of the people questions that I might otherwise miss. Um, but yes, we do work with a lot of technologies to try and scale what we do with our founders. Um, we haven't invested in any of them yet, although we've come close with a couple. Um, so yeah, we see a lot of the health tech stuff. But I'll say the caveat is that we, um, I think the bar for us to invest in a health tech company is a lot higher because A, we see a lot of it, and B, we're really worried about being typecast as the health tech people because we're not. We're sector agnostic. We just really care about health for our founders. Um, and so if we end up with a portfolio filled with health tech companies, I'm afraid that that's all I'll ever see again. Right. You know, you, it's interesting you talked about the bar uh, in terms of the bar being pretty high. And I know I spoke to Will about the bar being pretty high when it comes to investing in digital health companies. And you had an interesting approach and strategy in terms of thinking about these three things that the company, sort of three points on your checklist. And one being the data has to be actionable, or at least the data that is that this new technology is surfacing up needs to. Yeah. Um, so talk about those the the three points on your checklist yeah. when you look at a startup. I mean, in general, the topic we're addressing tonight is really really broad, and without a whiteboard to segment things, I get a little lost. I'm a whiteboard whiteboard addict, so I'm giving myself that caveat if I start wandering in the woods a little bit. But um, Digital health. Yeah, digital health. You, you, you narrowed it well, because as we were talking, I was like watching myself wander across my own whiteboard in my mind. Um, so I, the thing that's really interesting, so we were lucky enough to be a small investor in Lavonga, and our friends at General Catalyst are very, very involved. And I think what's interesting about diabetes from a digital health standpoint, from and, and for me, you end up breaking things down into access to diagnoses, treatment, and then preemptive treatment is kind of the way, one way I organize the world. And I think what's really great if you can about diabetes is the data you can get directly from a patient and digitize has not just correlation but causation with the actual outcome in the disease right so and they're already doing it in a form factor that's super easy they're pricking their finger you can start digitizing that you can make their life easier by setting them strips all these things and what you know dramatically correlates to the outcome right so a lot of this comes for me when you're thinking about good versus great and unfortunately venture capitalists have to back things they think could be great you need that optionality um, that chain of thinking becomes very, very important. Um, a place that's near and dear to my heart, um, cardiology, my grandfather died of a heart attack, my uncle died at 35, and my dad died a year and a half ago from a heart attack. And, and so I've explored a lot of the cardio side of things of what can you do from a digital standpoint because you can gather a lot of correlated data, but causation on cardio problems is really, really tough and you can't really find it. And so. That's been a real stumbling block for me for taking on more full stacks, the wrong answer, but Levon is almost a full stack approach to managing diabetes from making sure it's diagnosed to making sure you're treating it with traditional modalities to getting upstream, you're getting, you're getting the data consistent enough, you're reading it, you're on a curve to understand dietary changes, things you can do upstream that then 30 Secret ultimately save the self-insured companies more money, which is a big part of the equation of building a great company. Um, so that's been the real challenge is finding disease states where what you can pick up is, has causation and not correlation. And, and I think it's fallen short of us and we may, we may be screwing up with some of that. I, I've got a friend doing a thing called Heartbeat in New York, which is really, really interesting, which is trying to reimagine how you get cardio care. And there's a lot of great things they're doing and connected scales. And there's some things that can start getting close to COPD and some other other derivatives of it, but I, I really held the bongo as a gold standard for getting to true causation, um, at least in that aspect. There's a lot of other ways to slice it, but on that full scale, that's where, that's where that data and what you can track and how it leads to changing outcomes has become paramount for me. So this is very insightful that you're looking at uh, solutions for conditions, but uh, when I look at Ariel like, talking about solutions that are, you know, helping somebody who can hear and then also helping 
uh, a person who is a fighter pilot. And same solution applying on both sides could be very transformative. And I almost feel like there is two generation of digital health solutions that are coming out. One is iterative, because they can make diabetes frictionless like Livongo, but it could be transformative that they can actually use brain plasticity to look, uh, to listen to things that they were not able to. So when you are investing in these companies, are you looking at um, two buckets of transformative that I'm gonna take a bet on this or? I think that's a really great way to frame it. And I, that is what absolutely what we do, but I don't think I've put it in those terms. And I was, I was hearing everyone as we were sitting waiting to come on the panel and listening to the, the, uh, the intro speeches, I do think that you, you do need to start segmenting yourself in those. You do need the iterative solutions and there's some, hey, we have problems today that we can use digital tools to address, right? And again, for me, it's more access in general than access to diagnoses and then access to conventional treatments that might not be perfect, but we know have statistical relevance and efficacy and change lives. And then moving into things in those iterative disease states that make a difference. So like, that is definitely one chain of thinking that has to exist as a baseline to start using digital to move outcomes. Um, now the line of thinking on what you're looking for, how big an outcome, how to make a dent becomes a different chain. I think when you get into what Ariel's working on and the more transformative, it falls into the, it better be science, it better be 10x better, 10x cheaper, old school venture, semiconductor venture capital, where when you're right, it does make that big a dent. And so I, I think, we're slightly less equipped to look at that without some friends. We have, we've, we've done things more on where tech, meets, where tech meets bio using big data to refine targets and molecules. But I, I do think those are, are the two paths. And I, I get a little worried sometimes that people spend too much time on the transformative without getting some of the building blocks right that can change lives today, take advantage of known modalities and known data. Um, you see the narrative flip flop a little bit, but I think that's a really great way to segment the work. I think you do actually. It's interesting that you brought that up, Arshana, because I do think that Ariel, and I think you're right that you're a different investor than Ariel, but Ariel, I think when you do invest, you actually go for both. Because it's particularly with hypno relief, right? Uh -huh. I mean, that is something that is transformative and iterative. I mean, it, it's. It, Talk a little bit, we want to get back to sort of the four pillars, right? Nutri nutrition um, and um, sleep, exercise, sleep, and mindfulness. And, and hypno, hypno relief is somewhat mindfulness in, in some ways, at it's, least. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a fascinating project. Uh, I mean, we're fortunate to have David Spiegel here at Stanford, who's, I think, the world foremost expert in hypnosis. Met him a couple of years ago. And he's done, he does some great work in his office using hypnosis to treat addiction, to treat chronic pain. Cancer too. Uh, yeah, all sort of things, and, and, uh, which obviously given all the problems we know about uh, drug overuse, et cetera, it's just fabulous. And he wanted to, he said, you know, but I want to scale this. How do we scale this? So this project is very early, but what, I, what I've done with David is um, uh, we built Alexa skills that basically help you go through self-hypnosis for, we started with smoking cessation and chronic pain. And so I'm trying to combine something that is proven, which is the hypnotherapy, if you will, with some new technologies that can make it broader. And to be perfectly honest, I don't know if this project, from a business standpoint, I don't know where it goes, but it's just something that we think can do a lot of good, so we're going at it, just let's see how much good it can do, and then we'll take it from there. So we run into clinical trials, and the, the original results from the clinical trials are incredible. We're getting on the smoking cessation, 20% uh, success rate. I mean, most treatments are like single digit, and this is like free on your Alexa skill. So yeah, I mean, but it it's combines and something funky and new with something proven. But you can, you can, it's commercialized. You can get that on Alexa now, oh, right? Oh, it's, it's there, we have, but it's there for free. Yeah, so now we just put it up there, and you can go and you can install it. So yeah. I would argue slightly that that's a really good iterative solution where you've got a you've got a known yeah. you've got a known modality for making a difference and you're just putting it on rails Fair. right I mean and, and that doesn't I think transformative is being you or, or, or iterative is being used pejoratively or it can be in this in the in the healthcare industry and I think 
both can have massive dents in the universe. Um, I guess what Arshana meant, and I, well, you can speak for yourself, yeah, but I'm thinking that I'm you could use it for different. Yeah, you are far. <laughs> I'll come sit over there. Is that making it easier? No, Come no, on, no, bring you your stool over here. Transformative in that it changes yes. the way you view. Sort of, I yeah. look at this and say that you can actually treat depression with with something like hypnos hypnosis, right? Because you're it's sort of behavioral, cognitive behavioral therapy. You're putting yourself in a totally different mental state. But but sorry, I'll just jump in there because I'm slightly fired up on this, which is. Um, I think for the entrepreneurs in the room, what's, what's helpful is a lot of that was known, right? That you can use that, that hypnosis has clinical efficacy in those, in those areas. And so I think a lot of people looking to harness innovation and scale it and reach more people, right? You don't need to, a lot of that science was there and it was about creating it in a more scalable, frictionless fashion, right? We've yeah, got it's very different than if we're doing, say, the haptic feedback. And we're still not sure, is, is it really going to work? We think it yeah, early, right. but you still need to do the science. This, so we know it works. We, we've got one that we like called Mightier, which is doing, um, in, a, in a clinic, it's going after ADHD. And they've figured out how to, this is right up your alley. I don't know if we talked about this. You're going to like this one. Which is, they figured out in a clinic how to use biofeedback against video games to, treat, to teach kids how to modulate their emotional state. So you start playing a video game, if you get too worked up, if you get too over your skis, if you start tripping into what looks like ADHD behavior, the game pauses, coaches you, works through a heart rate sensor and, a, and a, basically a back, a wrapper on the game to pause it until you calm down. And, they, and they, they have clinical studies they've done that they've had for a while that it's works, it works in the clinic. And so the, the, the company's goal could be transformative because now you're taking kids not only getting them off ADHD, but giving them tools across their life, life from a wellness standpoint. And what it is, it's about reducing the friction. So the, the clinical science, like we, there was no investment any, we had to make in the clinical science, it works. It's about putting it on rails like an Alexa skill so that you can reach and proving that you can get the same adherence in a household because it's, you're, they're willing to wear a heart rate monitor that mom or dad has and play a video game that is, right? So they're, 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 the, the challenge there is getting the distribution and getting it in a friction-free environment. Well, there's so much low-hanging fruit in healthcare that iterative solutions can be massive companies. Like, you don't really need to... I mean, exoskeletons are great, and they can be very powerful for certain subsets, but you don't need to create exoskeletons to make a lot of money in healthcare, right? I yeah, mean, and, 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 and that point is, it depends. If, if, you, if the goal is to make a lot of money, I would not be doing half the stuff. <laughs> well, but it's that. also impact-wise, impact right? If we can get... If we can make video games the on-road to understanding meditation and modulating your emotional state and reduce pharma's impact on kids that's like it's iterative 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 from a science standpoint but like transformative impact wise and so I, I like your frameworks and maybe the words need to be slightly broken apart but you can have iterative things that end up having a huge impact from a wellness standpoint. So I, it's, uh, I almost want to qualify that there's n one is not better than the other um, and then when the first pinch that happened to, to diagnose glucose was transformative. It created a whole new uh, space for understanding diabetes. So that was transformative. And then we kept on iterating, making it better. So there is nothing different or bad in one or the other. I just almost want to think what you're investing, where are you putting those uh, in that space? Yeah, I would say. Too. It's also important to think about the fact that uh, the iterative companies today, from an impact perspective, can probably have more impact, at least in the immediate future, with more people than the transformative ones. Uh, and one of my favorite examples right now is a company called Frame Health, and they give patients a personality test. And then based on that personality test, they then teach the nurses and the doctors how to speak to that patient, and it drives different results. It drives really compelling results. And so an example would be some patients respond to authority. And so the doctor comes in in the lab coat and says, you need to take this medicine and you need to follow this. Some patients respond to community. And so the nurse will come in and say, your family is depending on you to do this plan to survive and like take care of them. And there's just 10 different categories of patient and it drives really big changes in adherence. Um, and that's a very small I, I, you just said a key word that we hadn't hit on yet, which is a lot of what we look for is how do you drive adherence? Because a lot of these solutions are, you go down to the chain of command of like clinical efficacy, you can make it work in a real world outside of a vacuum chamber, but if you're not doing something to drive adherence, it's all smoke in the wind. Everything I'm looking at right now has a 
Yeah, I mean, adherence it, is a core piece to what they're doing. Yeah, and, and, and I think that's the third pillar for us. Yeah, uh, a, third pillar, I think Jake pillar. is talking about how do you incent people, incentivize to people to do, to do things, and it's sort of understanding the psychology of that person and how they interact and, and, and how they take... People aren't cattle, um, right? Everyone's right. different. I was just talking to Pankaj... Where I, yeah, we talked about this earlier about uh, when we were saying how do you, how is treating people differently today as a physician, as a lifestyle medicine physician, and you talked a lot about understanding the patient, uh, understanding that patient journey and understanding how that patient receives information. It's very different. The patient is, is a customer today, right? Did you? Yeah. yeah, I think I precision like motivation is a really great turn of a phrase for that. Um, and I just think for people building companies, understanding the importance of how your solution platform company is going to increase adherence is just as important as any breakthrough along the chain. You really to have a big impact in a big in a big company. If you stop short of adherence, it just it, it's the gas in the car. And there's a lot of things that go into it here. I mean, I was looking at a company that they make a 3D print pills, and the whole goal of the company is to increase adherence amongst patients that have to take a lot of medicines, because you can put three or four medicines in a single pill. But what they didn't realize, it's a very smart idea, right? What they didn't realize is that their pills are now a little bit larger, and they look weird. And so when a patient gets that home, they don't want to take it. It's, it's larger, it has a texture to it, it's kind of cloudy, it's not what they're used to. This comes to the point where Esther, you like this because you're all about short term versus long term. And the problem with adherence, the problem that people who they don't adhere to things, and we talked about this, is people don't adhere to vitamins because there's no short term impact. They will adhere to aspirin because it gets rid of their headaches. So how do you change? How do you create adherence when there is no when that when the evidence doesn't come until? I mean, several years. It's funny because we've been using the term adherence, but coming from many, many years of doing more traditional consumer internet and so on, where the word engagement is all we live and die by, um, we know it, for different reasons that if our customer, if customers are not engaged with the product, they're going to stop using it, you're going to go out of business. So the good news is there's a lot of expertise outside the medical um, side of things, but just coming from the more traditional tech of knowing how to keep engaged, use, I mean, Facebook is pretty good at this, right? Engaging uh, customers and keeping them engaged. And so maybe we can also think about it, part of it is adherence, and part of it is if you're engaged with whatever benefit you're gonna get, then that might be. Well, one of your companies is Get one fix is that yes, it? And yes. so, and they're all about changing it's really behavior this, around this, nutrition. That's a really good one because it's a company that's focused on helping you uh, eat more healthy and achieve. If you, if you, for example, have a target weight that you want to change, achieve that. And one of the things that the company discovered initially, it was very customized for each person, different, and so on, and lots of variables. And one of the key learnings was. We were trying to do too much, we were overwhelming people, and if we can get people to do one thing, that could have such a, and it was such a strong, compelling point that we renamed the company. So the company, which was called Metabolic Inc., now it's called Get One Fix. So what's that one, one thing? One thing, Eat. well, it's not, the one thing is not the same for each person. You have to figure out what yes, makes sense point. for each person. It's not generic, Precision, but- Precision, motivation. We'll, so we figure the person out and then we tell for you, just do this, don't do anything. And even that thing, after a while, you get it down, then move on to the next one. So that it, was one way of doing age. So almost like it goes back to the tiny habits that BJ Fogg talks about is like you want to build that tiny little one thing or a habit that leads to more changes, that kind of dominoes effect, so to say. Yeah. And then one of the things that I notice in my practice is when we have our goal ill-defined, then people are not engaged or um, adhering, a better word. Okay, so if somebody is thinking they want to lose weight, they would they think already that they have more weight they're carrying. They're in, not inclined to go to the gym because they are kind of conscious about it. 
So we start looking at why do you want to lose weight? The why question becomes really, really important. So that's the internal motivator. So they want to feel better, more energy, they want to climb the mountain, or whatever their goal is. So you want to get them to the first step. Um, so we need to look at delight as the end point and not so much lose weight or maintain your diabetes or hypertension, but how good you're feeling at the end of the doing this one thing. And the second one that we notice is data. So that's something that I'm hoping that, you know, the investment, the future investment has a data that ties it into the delight. So they're giving them the data or feedback that they're feeling better about it. So your investment, for example, the one thing, does that tie back to um, any data that they give back that the patient or the end user is starting to feel that it's making their life better? I mean, it's, it's definitely too early. I mean, this company is <laughs> literally just getting started. Obviously, there's an important feedback loop. Um, I want to mention, have, mention, you made me think of something that I think is pretty relevant. Have, have any of you heard about Dana Reilly's weight scale without uh, an LCD? It's brilliant. So what would your reaction be to a weight scale that doesn't show you your weight? <laughs> well, guess what? Every day there's all this variability and you get in and you're usually disappointed with what you see for one thing, one reason or another. You don't do it at the right time. The right way to give you feedback is to collect all that info and then on the right time frame, at the right moment, quantifying the data, understanding, show you how you're doing. So that's the project that he has, which I think is, I mean, you first hear it, you go, oh, this is what? But it's pretty brilliant. But the interesting conversation we had on engagement was, uh, so the dean of the Stanford Medical School, Lloyd Miner, is an investor in the fund, and so he's kind of one of our favorite, hey, this is interesting, Lloyd, what do you think calls? And when we were talking about this topic, he pointed out to a model we'd never, I'd never thought of as an innovation, that drove a lot of impact that for people who like subscription businesses probably has the longest LTV of anyone in the world, and that's AA. Mm. AA, if you were charging, and, and, and this is like full disclosure talking in our book, we're actually backing a alcohol, we don't call it addiction, but we're backing a platform to reimagine your relationship with alcohol for millennials in a digital fashion. But the really big aha moment from that was community. And it's one thing that in consumer apps, you go through this whole world, you kind of need to round trip completely and realize that when you begin to bake community in, which has positive and negative reinforcements to it, right? you become accountable, you get the light, you get these feedback loops that really drive engagement and adherence. So I, I'm, I, I think paramount for us is data. The more you are actually having causation on moving a number, the easier, it, the more it goes from vitamin to aspirin because you have action, reaction, action, reaction. I think when you get out of that loop, Community is a big thing we look for is how are you in real life, I mean, there's a whole other three hours to be spent on the role humans with tech and data have for scaling access to services and healthcare. Um, but in this world, it, it, it's virtual or otherwise creating community in this, in this company we backed called Hip Sobriety that's doing this largely for millennial women, but, but broadly a millennial population to re, kind of reimagine their relationship with alcohol she organically built this unbelievable online community where people started getting tattoos and staying in touch and looking for ways to, ways to, ways to recreate their, this culture in, in different fashions. And the adherence and the change in lifestyle has been unbelievable from the community she's built. May I try for a second to get a question from the audience? So does, I'm gonna bring it back to the investment. So does that mean that that's now a fundamental criteria that you have as you look at companies with whom you invest? that they also have to have a community around their solution? Or, I, I'm not nearly that dogmatic. Everything's okay. fair game all the time. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but I think in places that we're looking at that are trying to change outcomes that don't have data with causation, it, I, it, then I go down the line of adherence. And if I don't get to that point, and community is one I like to look for if you're not using it, it becomes a really interesting angle of how do you bake so that Bambi and I are in this together and we can drive outcomes. So now that I'm, it, it absolutely goes in my adherence logic if it's bakeable into the and product. The, so, the if you're, so if you have, if you're driving, if it's, if that is drive, if that's a, one of the recipes for success and driving outcomes and driving outcomes from the perspective of an investor so that you're able to get your return on your investment, would that not then become an, a criteria? How do you go about criteria in the space as you look to solutions? Like, is it just because it's a, sh a shiny new object 
and it, it kind of sounds good? You know, it, or I are, think what most investors, we, we don't have a bunch of check boxes that we say, okay, does it need to have this, 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 this. It's much more intuitive pattern recognition. Usually there's one thing about it that we love and nothing that's a showstopper, some combination. So yeah, it's, it's, it's very case by case. I, I, mean, I, I think, think can I, can I say something? Because I'm a big believer in community, but I wouldn't say that's a criteria, but I would say that what community creates is accountability. And if you want to change behavior, that is one of the biggest factors that changes your behavior, whether it's accountability to yourself, your unborn child, your husband, your children, whatever it is, but your community group, um, that's a big driver of uh, behavior. So. I think that's what, you know, does this product create accountability? But I do want to say one thing because I think, Jake, you have something that is also very similar that creates this feedback loop. Doesn't necessarily have a community, but the company Avail, what I like about Avail is that it yeah. captures all of this different data, but at the same time, you're also capturing unstructured data continually. And I think that combined actually helps the, with the feedback loop and also some sort of like personalization, ongoing personalization and, con and communication with the with the person, That's right. the patient. It, it goes to what Will has been saying, which is that, you know, I think Quantified Self 1.0 was all about just collecting data. And I think what we're doing now is we're trying to collect data and find something actionable with it, right? You have all this data that you've collected in your life. What do you do with it to make your life a little bit better? And Avail is trying to do that. So they collect a bunch of structured data points. They can import stuff from your Apple Watch, whatever. Um, but then they also ask you questions throughout the week. And over the course of a week or a month, and those questions end up accumulating to what is like a full panel of questions. And they track that over time and start surfacing uh, suggestions to you and useful information, useful data for your life. I think we're still in the very early stages of being able to get data that's not just your blood sugar level and your heart rate into these platforms, um, but I think it's where everything will ultimately go. We call that human labeling. I, th I think <laughs> actually what, what you're saying is uh, uh, exemplified with uh, your friend Mark Ganey and, and Strava in that uh, you can buy a Garmin watch and you can you know, capture all that data, but it really took you know, uh, Strava to pull it into a social application that really drove uh, you know, adoption and, and the whole what Will was saying around the, the whole community aspect. I don't think you can game it. I don't think you can incentivize it. I think it has to be organic and, and natural and part of you know, who you are. And I think that's the brilliant thing that, uh, that Strava achieved uh, through their community aspect of that application. You know, one, there are obviously many ways of going about it, but one thing about Strava that, that, that I do want to point out is it's often very hard to go to launch a product that without the community has no value, that it needs the community to, to have value, and then you end up with this catch-22 that until you have the community, you don't have a value, how do you get the people? The hybrid, which is what Strava did, is on day one, it was valuable for you. You can go and you can do a right, and we would give you feedback, and that was good. And then some hardcore people did it, and then the community starts to make it more powerful. So I think you, it's, it's, you have to be careful not to get too carried away with like, okay, let's go to this community, but on day one, where do you start? So sometimes you have to but, but use it to complement But from the very beginning, it. he thought about the social component. I remember talking to Mark, and yeah. he was saying, you know, the camaraderie when he was a rower at Harvard was yeah. so great, you know, and how do you build that into an application? Yeah, but so, I think if had, had he done a product that only worked with community, I don't think it would have taken off. Do we keep talking or are we done? I mean, this is such a, I think everybody, well, the, yeah, people want to ask questions. We've got engagement. And we have engagement. This is, this is definitely engagement, engagement not, not adherence, adherence, right? It's not adherence. We are not ad The community is not pressuring us enough to get off the microphone. Okay, so I've spent 20 years in the medical device world. Uh, so regulated medical device, everything's nice. And as an investor perspective, it's probably pretty easy to say, hey, you got a product, you're going to treat a disease, and you have outcomes. So now that we're seeing kind of the fall off and the, the failure of kind of the genotyping world, you look at the human longevity, 80% down round, look, geno genotypes aren't going to matter. It's actually the phenotype. The problem is in the health and wellness space, which is why we're all here, it's much, much harder to see what are you chasing, right? You're chasing a, a, a you know, heterogeneous world of outcomes and behaviors and everything else. What's it going to take for you guys to write a check 
to, a, to an early stage startup that's going to get you excited when there isn't a clear path to what the return is, right? So for example, it's not a treatment for IBS, it's a treatment to get people healthier. But we all know that people get, getting people healthier is actually what's going to bend the cost curve, which is where the size of the prize is. Uh, he's not going to like my answer. Someone have a better <laughs> one than me. <laughs> I mean, so you're the first. You're you're much. No, I'll throw out like a really generic answer, <laughs> which is just if you can't solve a really identifiable problem, I mean, it's going to be a tough road to hoe for you. But you could go the you know 23andMe route, which is just to productize it and make it kind of sexy and interesting. And maybe you oh. don't deliver a big result to start. That's that's not fair with 23andMe, right? What, what, so we've got two companies taking the 23andMe approach, one with dogs and the other with the biome. And right, there was a first order, we talk 10x and 100x, it's not science, but it's like, do you love do, do you love one part of the story and like the chances of something crazy happening? And, and you biome was great. There was a small subset of the population that was super interested. There were some doctors that thought they could find causation in the data. So you build a product for that. But the real game was how the hell do we get the first 100,000 biomes dramatically sequenced in a super malleable fashion, right? And then and 23andMe was there was a subset of the population that was super interested in having the data, even though there wasn't anything actionable to do with it from a clinical standpoint or small things. And, and then you get the data footprint. So I do think it doesn't get divorced from you need to have, you need to have a near term, you have near term value and then you can have the squint at, hey, this gets really interesting. My, my answer was going to be that, that through the history of innovation, it's unfortunately or fortunately what the government and, institu and, and not-for-profit institutions have been really, really good at. And it's something my partner Dave, as he chases down, how do you deal with brain health? A big part of the component that's struggling is there's a lot of work that needs to be done that doesn't have commercial appeal, right? And so what he's exploring is how do you put a not-for-profit, for-profit lab and investing environment together so that you can have somebody spend time on something they're passionate about that is a first or second derivative from solving something commercial and having a big impact. And so I, I do think that's where you do look to institutions, you look to skinny down experiments, you try to get something sandbox where you begin to get data against an indication. Um, so this area isn't new and there's a lot of clients and or health plans and such with incumbent solutions. and. A lot of them are legacy and not very good. Um, but how do you guys, from an investor's perspective or as investors, once there is a solution or you, you find something that's good and working and everything is there, the numbers are there, the return on investment's there, and it still becomes a bit of a challenge to get into kind of some of these um, clients. Do you guys, as investors, is that something that you're helping with or that you think about or have you navigated in the past is my question. I keep having strong takes, so I'm going to try to sit this one. Do you want me to go? Uh, are you referring about like the go-to-market strategy, the sales and distribution, how do you get the product out? Yeah, how do you, uh, get, how do you get it to a sell? How do you get it to a pair? Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, <sighs> the high-level answer is that that needs to be part of either it needs to be part of the pitch from the company from, they, from the beginning, or we need to be able to help them come up with one, but that's often more important than the actual product or technology. If there's no way of success, successfully distributing and selling it, as with any technology, you're, you're in bad shape. But, I mean, sometimes you get a teams that they don't have that expertise. So yeah, part of what we try to do is either, maybe either us or Let's bring someone that has that expertise that can help them. Sometimes it was the other way around. That they nailed that very creatively. <laughs> so the, I, the double click on that is I think the sooner you begin building with that in mind and understanding the KPI of the payer, right? I think we've had a lot of issues. Where we've run into issues is companies are working on that way. We, none of us think about it because we're like, oh, we get through to the impact. Everyone's going to buy it. And the reality is the way they measure KPIs and the way the payers talk about things can be apples and oranges with how the, sci the scientific community does or the founder community. And so... Our solution has been, the founder may not have it, but day zero of us putting money in, it becomes how are we measuring against what matters, right? We're, we're, we're in a IVF solution called Stork Club that's actually been going more to become parental benefits, but started in how do you get more education and how do you build a marketplace similar to Carrot, and I know someone here was there, so there's some other solutions. The aha moment in IVF wasn't from the consumer side. 
right? You can do a lot of things. If you're not tracking from day one how you reduce NICU days, right? The whole, the whole boom in fertility benefits and education and the platforms from the consumer side is unbelievable and magic as having two of my partners who've been through that, those cycles ad nauseum and, and it can be unbelievably scary and frightening. The reality is if you aren't talking about from the get-go how you reduce NICU days, because that's actually what gets adoption is it's 90K a day for every NICU baby. And if you do fertility well, you can increase it. If you don't do it well, it goes up dramatically. So I think it's about measuring from day one for whatever the KPI is on the payer side and understanding that importance as well as clinical outcomes. So Bambi and, and Arjun, if you don't mind, how about we just take one final question because she's been standing here for quite a while. One final question, and then we'll do the thing that's good for everyone's health, and we'll get up and we'll stretch our legs. <laughs> We're gonna, yeah? okay. Yeah. We'll also have Anthony come in. Thank you. you don't wanna share a little bit, Anthony? After the question, Anthony. Yeah, I just had a question about how you're looking at adherence and education, because I think that's a really big component and proponent for uh, patient adoption. Then also as a clinician, seeing patients come in with different apps. I mean, I think we're almost getting to the point where there's some sort of wearable fatigue. And onboarding the physician is actually really important in patient adoption because if they're coming in, and fortunately I'm someone who actually likes tech and digital health applications, so I enjoy speaking to my patients about that, but a majority of physicians are not well equipped in dealing with that. And so how do you address those types of situations? I have, a, I have a company called um, Baby Scripts, and they are a, a, a mobile app and a connected scale and a blood pressure cuff. And the idea is that uh, a pregnant mother can stay on the scale every day, check her heart rate, and that data gets sent to their doctor so that they can reduce the number of prenatal visits, I think from 13 visits to six visits or something. Um, that is a solution that everybody loves, right? The app has a lot of education built into it. This is what you should be doing this week. It's sort of like what to expect when you're expecting, in addition to a very functional improvement in people's lives. And the improvement is that the doctor now gets paid the exact same that they would get paid for managing that pregnancy, the prenatal care, but they only have to see the patient half as many times, and they get real-time data. The patient doesn't have to take as many days off work, is getting real-time data, and if they ever freak out about something, they can message their doctor right away, right? It's a win-win-win that includes education. Um, so like something like that, like adoption is a no-brainer, right? Yeah, I mean, I think ideally you want a product that uh, is as uh, self-explanatory and, and, and as a foolproof as possible. So at Neosensory, the one with the haptics, uh, one of the criteria was, well, a lot of our customers are going to be elderly because the elderly are losing their hearing. So the product, this band, needs to be standalone. It can be something that you need to have your smartphone. That might be fine for us. It's not it's not for them, they can get it, they put it on, and it just works. So I think part of it's, it doesn't apply everywhere, but definitely something worth striving for are products that they just, you get on them and they work, or you use them and it works and it just. And, and I'm gonna be a broken record on this and slightly uninteresting, which is there should be fatigue because there aren't that many. I, I think again, if you're not changing outcomes, I don't think a doctor is gonna let it in. A doctor shouldn't let it in their office, let alone ask patients to drive it. So I, I think if it's not, data that has causation that you're generating in a unique way, if it's not driving more adherence because the solution is more seamless or you're not building in some other adherence solution that moves an outcome, it probably shouldn't make a doctor's radar. I think the, the also the, qu the key question is the trusted source, right? right? So there is, yeah, right. what's happening is the payer is investing, whether it's self-insured employers, the United Healthcare's of the world, they're investing in standalone solutions that are given to an employee or their member. And then they go to the doctor and the doctor is giving them a whole different set of things that are given by a trusted source. So the patient is having fatigue, not just because of so many apps, but also because they are hearing a different um, set of uh, information from their trusted source and, and getting different sets of resources from their payer. And, that, and that's where my point would be. I think the movement on outcomes yeah. is, very, is qualitative, not quantitative in that point. Yeah. Because if it wasn't, the doctor and the payer would be aligned, and they're getting to qualitative solutions on changing outcomes uh, versus quantitative. Can I say something? I think this conversation actually would be good for the second panel well, as well, considering we have now 15 <laughs> minutes or 10 minutes to go ahead and have a little bit of wine. But I'm sorry. Did everyone hear that? What makes you think the doctor has the time? 
can we I can, mean, can we look at future of can we table that and then bring that that's up? That's where the AI comes because in that because now you're talking to doc you. you're talking to Doctor <laughs> Chatbox. <laughs> okay, I do want to also sit, bring in Anthony because really quickly because Anthony, you know, is one of our sponsors and um, and he's thank going you so to much. Hi everyone, I won't take but a second. Uh, my name is Anthony Shell. I'm a principal with Avis & Young. We're a real estate brokerage for technology companies, VCs and their portfolio companies. It has been an absolute honor to join Bambi, the Vader family, the HP family as part of this Invent Health series over the past uh, year. I always feel by far like the dumbest person in the room when I come to these, so thank you for the education. I always try to offer a little perspective on health-based office space planning and what we're seeing by big technology companies um, and how they're taking care of their employees. We know that this war for talent across the Bay Area and across the world rages on for the best employees and finally employers are taking, they, they have been taking notice for some time about building healthy workspaces for their employees. Obviously benefits like healthy uh, cafeterias and office design. But I was um, caught by something that was being discussed about community versus data capture, feedback loop, how do we get um, we know employees, employers want their employees to be healthy. And because employees spend so much time in the office environment, how do we get them to adopt these practices, whether it be wearables or what have you? And I just thought I'd mention in a little bit of data that I've captured with my clients who do this, it is a combination of community uh, data capture and other sort of factors. It seems like all in one, and I think it just sort of really rings true the statement that someone said in the crowd that it, it is not all, it's, it is not one source that will force this adoption by, uh, by individuals. Um, and happy holidays to everyone. I hope everyone and enjoys the break. Happy holidays and 7.05, we are going to kick it off again. So um, everybody just bring your drinks over. Just get two glasses and fill your plate. <laughs>